Welcome to Sunday morning here at First Baptist Church in Berlin. We're so glad you've joined us today. Our opening verse for the day is found in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for your blessings on the time we spend in your word. Open our hearts, our minds to receive what you have for us today. Bless each one who's hearing these words that I pray today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This week, our nation is uh, officially honoring all those who have served and are serving in the armed services. The day was originally known as Armistice Day in honor of the end of World War I, when on the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, peace finally came to war-torn Europe. It's kind of ironic, though, that that holiday was not made an official holiday in the United States until 1938. And at that point, uh, another world war was already brewing. It's really a sad commentary on the state of our world and reminding us that peace is fleeting and we will never really know a true peace until that day the Prince of Peace rules and reigns on this earth. In 1954, the name Armistice Day was changed to Veterans Day to honor all those who are willing to put their lives on the line for the protection and preservation of the freedoms that we enjoy as an American. Uh, today, we want to say thank you for all those who have served in the armed forces and continue today to serve as well. May God really bless you and may God bless America. Today's message, we're going to talk about making wise decisions. May I ask you a question? Have you ever had trouble making a decision? Uh, maybe you're one of those who are the habitually indecisive. Uh, I know that sometimes being indecisive can drive others crazy when there's decisions somebody's waiting on you to make and you don't really know the direction that you think or you know that you should go. And I wonder sometimes, are we afraid of making decisions because we think we may choose poorly? We don't have confidence in the decision that we're going to make. We really need some direction. What's interesting is, according to one study, adults today will make 35,000 decisions. That's every single day. Some 35,000 decisions. Now, some of these we don't even think about, but there are indeed all types of decisions. We have to put some thought into our thought processes, of course. And the truth is, we're, we make a decision by not making a decision. In reality, we make decisions by default, by simply not doing something. Uh, so it gets kind of complicated. It, it takes some tremendous wisdom. And today I want to talk about making wise decisions. What decisions, for instance, should Christians make concerning the turmoil our nation is experiencing right now? With the elections just having taken place and a lot of discord and disharmony that's happening, what should we be doing? There are some important decisions that we should make. And I'm convinced that the scripture gives us answers and gives us direction that we need. Now, you may have other things in your life, uh, decisions that you need to make. We all go through different seasons of life. There's a times as we're growing, we have to make decisions to what we're going to do in our lives. All of us do really from day to day in the future. But there are young people who are trying to decide what they're going to do. What um, what direction should they go? Should they go to college? Should they uh, take up a trade? What should they do? There is the point of uh, whom should I uh, uh, date or marry that a young person will have to decide. There are decisions uh, that we continually face. Uh, throughout our lives, and um, we, we have to make them continually, of course. Um, but I'm convinced that God will give us the wisdom that we need. I think it's important, though, that we look at decisions in that way and through the light of the Word of God. Uh, the first thing we've been looking at in our series of messages is that decisions 
sound decisions need to be based on the principles of God's word. That doesn't mean that God tells us exactly for every single detail in our life uh, that he's given us a scripture to tell us exactly what to do. But there are principles that we can find and we want to make sure we do not violate biblical principles when we're making decisions. The second thing I think we need to be reminded of about decisions is that they do have consequences. They should not be taken lightly. And even there are some things that we do not regard as being necessarily that important. The decisions affect every part of our life. And so they, they do have their consequences. The t- today I want us to get to really the nitty gritty of the decision making process. If we are honest, I think we all can say and look back at some bad decisions which we have made. Now, some of those decisions may not have affected us to a great extent. But some of those decisions may have changed the entire course of our life. Now, how can we avoid bad decisions? How can we make wise decisions? What what can we do to be sure that we do not make a mess out of things? I think it's important we start with this and understand the power of decision making. Listen to, to what I have to say here. Understand the power of decision making. A couple weeks ago, we focused on the fact that decisions have consequences, and that truth cannot be overstated. God says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Decisions matter. They really do. You will reap what you sow. And you cannot sow sinful decisions and then pray for a crop failure. I've heard people really almost in that in that light of things say, well, you know, I'll, I, I'll sow my wild oats and then I'll just pray that none of them grow. Well, it doesn't work that way. There are consequences to our decisions. And so we need to be aware of that, aware of the consequences. But God has given us a wonderful power of choice. We really can make choices in our lives. And once again, we're reminded of one of the first verses we were looking at in this study. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, Joshua makes a statement. Choose for yourselves this this day whom you will serve. So make a choice. Make up your mind who you're going to serve. The fact of God's sovereignty does not mean that we do not have the ability to make individual choices. Now, God is sovereign. He is in absolute control. There is no question about that. There's no doubt at all. He is a sovereign God. But that does not remove our individual responsibility to choose to follow Him. And so many decisions that we make on a daily basis. I'm saying that because I have met people who have kind of a, a adopted and embraced what we call the Kesara Sara idea, ideology, and their attitude for their life. Kesara Sara, what will be, will be. They have come to the conclusion somehow that because God is sovereign, or some are not even uh, looking at it from the perspective of who God is, but they're approaching it, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And therefore, it doesn't make a difference what type of decision I make. I've even heard people, though, who claim to be followers of of God, who say, well, God's already got it planned out, so uh, whatever I do, if I make a stupid decision, that must have been God uh, telling me to do that. I mean, none of it, that obviously doesn't make sense. No no decision I make is going to make a difference anyway, some would say, so I might as well just live the way I want to live, and then it's going to... It's going to come out the way it's supposed to come out in the end. And they're misunderstanding some very important things. God has given us the power to make choices, and those choices make a huge difference in our lives. Let me give you just a couple suggestions here. Decisions will, first of all, determine our destiny. Decisions determine our destiny. One day Jesus had a conversation with the Jewish religious leaders, and remember those, they, they knew the Scripture, They knew very well, and they knew the Scripture foretold the coming of a Messiah. They knew those Scriptures which talked about that. And yet, as they looked at the Scripture, Jesus reminded them that. They said, search the Scriptures, for it's in the Scriptures you think you have life. Well, the Scriptures were pointing towards Him, but they were rejecting Him. They made that decision to do so. And Jesus goes on. This is recorded in John chapter 5, verse 40. He said, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. 
So you have the information that you need, but you've chosen to ignore that. So you made a decision to, to ignore uh, the fact that I'm the Messiah, Jesus is saying, and they rejected him. They made the choice to reject Jesus, even though he was the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies. So you need to understand that. If you have never put your faith and trust in Christ, you can say, well, I haven't made a decision to reject Christ, but if you have never received him as Savior, you are by default rejecting him. And if you've never made the decision to be a, a Christ follower, uh, you are choosing eternal death. I mean, that's you making a choice. It's determining your destiny. Our choices can determine our destiny. Our choices also reveal our character. You know what? You and I can profess to believe many things. Uh, however, the choices that we make really are giving evidence of who we really are. They give evidence. That's when our true character shows up. For example, we may claim to really love our spouses, but the choices that we make regarding our spouse may be saying the opposite. And may, we may not be showing to love towards them, our spouses or our children, whatever it might be. In the same, in the same light, many would say, well, I love God. And yet they don't really seem to have time for him. And uh, you rarely see, them, rarely see them at church or involved in different things that would be promoting the cause of Christ and, and so on. But they make a claim. But the truth is their choices are showing or revealing their true character. Our character will always be shown by our choices. The scripture says this in Proverbs 20, verse number 11. Even children are known by the way they act, whether their conduct is pure and whether it is right. It shows up. How we behave, the choices that we make, gives an evidence of that character within us. So there's a very important uh, principle here of understanding the power we have in making decisions. Also understand the power of prayer in our decisions. Now, when I talked to this morning, mentioned the message was about making decisions, uh, perhaps many of you are thinking, well, that's, he's probably going to talk about praying and before you make a decision. And of course, that is an important part of it. The book of James tells us this in chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's a good principle to understand. We, we need to uh, make a decision about something. If we're a follower of Christ, then we should go to God in prayer. And oftentimes we'll talk about praying about decisions when in reality we really haven't done that much praying. Nor have we really sought God's face. I want to talk about that. Praying for wisdom is an act of faith and its dependence upon God. When we take the time to truly pray about a decision that we're going to make. Now we're making, as we said, some 35,000 decisions every day. I'm not saying that you have to stop and pray about whether you're going to brush your teeth or whatever it is that you're doing at that moment. But obviously there are decisions that we don't know the, the correct direction to go. And we do need to be going to God with those. Um, that will, if we really are serious about this, we're going to be spending a great deal more of our time in prayer than uh, if we're really seeking him uh, for wisdom. But when we are praying and asking God's wisdom, we are in essence saying, Lord, I need your help. I believe you hear and answer prayer. I know that you know what's best for me. Therefore, I'm coming to you for wisdom, the wisdom I need to make this decision. That's basically what we're saying when we go to God in prayer. When we don't pray about our decisions, now think about what we are saying in essence. When we don't pray, we are basically saying, you know, I really don't, I don't really think that you know what's best for me, Lord. You'd say, well, I'd never say that. But we are saying that when we do not pray about the decisions and ask God for wisdom. Lord, I've got this one. I don't need you here. And, you know, I can take care of it myself. And so we need to be careful when it comes to this matter. It is important to bring our decisions to God to seriously pray and come before him seeking his direction. Now, what does it mean, though, to pray about decisions. Pray about decisions 
involves listening to God as well as us taking that particular need we have to God. How do we listen to God? Well, we listen through His Word. Many times we ask for God's help in making a decision because we really want to convince ourselves this the predetermined decision that we really want to make is right. So there's something that we want. There's something that we want to do. And so we may... We might even make it a matter of prayer to a certain extent and say, God, should I do this or not? And we're saying, well, God did not send lightning down from heaven and stop me, so therefore must be okay. Or we're, really, we're, we're really not seeking his face on that. We will often rely on some type of an emotional response or our feelings to determine what we would at that point call God's will for us. And... Uh, we, there's something we want to do, and so we go to God and say, Lord, should I do this or not? And, uh, but not really seriously seeking His face. How, how can we find out what it is that God wants us to do? Well, some even go so far as to try to find a proof text in the Bible. They know what it is that they want to do, and so uh, they might scour through the Bible a little bit and try to find a verse that might kind of indicate that that's what God wants them to do. And I think we've got to be so careful in that. God does speak to us, but he speaks to us through his word and through the principles of his word. In Psalm 119, 105, very familiar verse, it says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, we, most of us are probably very familiar with that verse, and we're thinking, all right, so God's word does show me uh, the way down the path. I want you to think about that. And in ancient times... Uh, if you were going to have a light on your path, you didn't have a high-powered flashlight with bright LED bulbs in it. it, it you were, you'd be holding something in your hand, which was a flickering flame or maybe a torch of some type, but it still would not give a, a super bright light. And what you'd have to do is very carefully uh, watch the, the, the light that's being shed there on your feet as you're walking down the path. You'd have to carefully be following that. And this is how that we're finding really the analogy of the Word of God. We need to carefully go through the Word of God. It shows us everything we need to see, but it is something we, we approach with this care and this really uh, desire to really seek what God is trying to tell us. Here's a very important thing to, to understand, never forget. If a decision you want to make there's something you'd really like to do, but it violates the principles of God's word. It's the wrong decision, no matter how you might feel, no matter what someone might be telling you about it, uh, no matter how badly you want to do that. If it violates the principles of God's word, don't do it. Most of us can become experts at trying to justify our actions when there's something we really want to do. And we'll often use the phrase, and I don't know how many times I've heard this one, the Lord is leading me to, and then something completely contrary to God's word is added on to that. I've seriously had people tell me that things that if really they were thinking and really looking in God's word, uh, they, they, they would know that it's completely against what the word of God is telling them to do. Uh, I've had uh, people tell me, I've had men tell me that they felt like that God was leading them to break up their homes and to leave their wife. Uh, I've had children tell me that they felt like uh, to do something completely in, contrary to the leadership of their family and their parents and so on uh, was, was God's leading. Uh, people have told me to uh, just to leave a church and go off and uh, have just break the connections or whatever, uh, for whatever reasons, was God leading them to do that? And yet, and, and each of those things I'm mentioning, to do what they're talking about was in a clear violation of the Word of God. We have to be so careful. The, don't judge what God is telling you to do by just how you happen to feel because your feelings can really distort the picture. Never place a feeling over God's revealed truth. While experiencing peace in our hearts over a decision that we're praying about is, can be a good indicator of the will of God in our decision. It can never override 
never override the clear instructions of the Word of God. Listen to this in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It mentions the peace in our hearts along with the Word of God. Notice how it's stated. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So peace comes really as we follow the revealed word of God. That's where we follow the wisdom that God has for us and wants us to experience. So be careful when it comes to praying. Yes, we indeed need to take everything to God and, and the decisions that we make. But we need to seek his answer and be sure that we are looking at the principles in the word of God and asking God to guide us and direct us. And, um, and sometimes we just need to wait until we can see the direction that God would have us to go. But never violate a biblical principle simply because we feel like we want to do something. That's not how God leads. There's something else I think is important. We need to understand the place of worship in making decisions. I want to refer to uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Listen to God's word. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, if you notice that scripture, we read those two verses. Uh, that last verse tells us that we can know God's perfect will for our lives. But how do we come to that point? And it begins by describing a total commitment to God and total surrender. And in that verse, the way that's translated here, that's why I chose this translation. It really kind of spells it out for us. It talks about giving ourselves to God, our bodies to God, total surrender and submission to him. That is truly what it means to worship. And when we come to that point, instead of copying the behavior in the world and, and letting the world uh, put us into its mold, so to speak, we will allow God to transform us and he causes us then to think the way we ought to think and that's how we can determine. That's how we can know his perfect will for our lives. What does it mean to worship? Well, worship is far more than singing praise to God or even participating in the church service through prayer and other what we maybe call spiritual activities. Uh, there's different things we do in a, in a service together. Um, Maybe we have a time of praise, a time of prayer in our services. We read scripture, um, have, the commun have communion together. Those are all great things to do, and that is worship. But that's not the only thing that is worship. Singing together, that's a wonderful time. But that's not all that's entailed in the idea of worship. Worship is not limited to one hour on Sunday morning. In reality, it should be an extension of everything that we do. Our lives should be worshiping God continually. Worship must come from the heart. It's not merely going through the motions. And this is a problem. Many people go to church and they think they're worshiping, but they're going through a ritual that means really nothing to them. A worship's not based on a ritual. We worship God when we give ourselves as a living, holy sacrifice, totally surrendered to Him. And that's when we experience the change we need in our thinking so we can truly know what God wants us to do, giving us the ability to make the right, the right decision, a wise decision. How can we truly worship God? First of all, worship comes from a redeemed heart of a man or a woman who has been justified before God by faith and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you may go to church. You can go every single day if you have the opportunity. You can go to church faithfully. You, go, you can go through all the, the motions of whatever that worship or what is called worship there might be, but you're not truly worshiping if you're not, first of all, child of God. So the first thing required for worship is 
to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Just trying to be religious by going through the motions is not truly worshiping God. Please understand that. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, there's a great illustration here. God has set up at this point the king of Israel. His name is Saul. And uh, he has told Saul, commanded Saul, to go destroy the Amalekites. Saul goes, God gives him a great victory, and he has complete, uh, the complete ability to fulfill what God told him to do and destroy every one of the Amalekites, all their flocks and everything. But he doesn't do that. Instead, they, the people save the best of the animals and the best of the things that they found there, although they were not supposed to. And Samuel now comes back to Saul, and uh, Saul is supposed to report back in and tell him how things have gone. And, and, he, and he tells Saul, uh, Samuel, he says, listen, we did everything God told me to do. And, and Samuel says, oh, wait a minute. I hear, I hear some bleeding of the sheep in the background. What's that about? And so Saul has to kind of um, come clean here. And he says, well, what happened is that the people decided that they, uh, they would um, preserve these, the very best of these different uh, things, and they'd bring it to God as a sacrifice. And here is Samuel's response, understanding what true worship is. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God is looking for our submission and surrender to him, which will, of course, result in obedience. Worship, worshiping God in reality is, is that that is coming from our heart, totally surrendered and submitted to him. And worship comes from a heart that desires God alone. Nothing less than God should satisfy the heart of the believer. The psalmist says this in Psalm 63, Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I will praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Worship is from a heart that is only satisfied as it's looking to God. Only God can truly satisfy that heart. Nothing less than God which truly satisfy. That is a heart of worship. And finally, true worship uh, of God is the desire to continue to build up our knowledge of God. We'll never reach the place as the followers of Christ in this life, where we should be satisfied with where we are in our walk with God. We should always have a desire to know more about Him and to be more surrendered to Him. God should always be on our minds. And everything we do should be done with reference to Him, if we're truly seeking His will. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It's all about God. It's focusing on Him. Um, so many times in this life we have decisions we have to make and we're wondering, what would God have me to do? But we haven't spent much time at all really thinking about God. He's not been really part of our process and our thinking processes. Therefore, we don't have the wisdom that we need to have. We can't fill our minds and our hearts and our lives with everything else and then expect to be able to discern God's perfect will for our lives and to make wise decisions. We will be influenced by what we bring into our lives and through our thought processes. We can't help but do that. And so the more we, we uh, put into things of God, the more we bring that in, the more we read of the Scripture and listen to the Word of God and focus on that and go to God in prayer, the more we're going to be able to discern things. We've heard the expression, garbage in, garbage out. That's exactly what happens if we do not bring in the pure word of God, our thoughts upon God. If we bring in the garbage of the world, that's going to be the result of our thinking process. We will not have a clean heart to guide us in the right decisions if we allow the clutter of the earth 
and of the world to remain in our hearts. Today, you're going to make some 35,000 decisions. Whatever you do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Are the decisions you're making, are they conforming to the principles of God's Word? Have you truly, honestly considered what God says about your decisions? Have you really taken the time to find out what God says about what it is that you want to do from His Word? Until we do that, we will not be making wise decisions. I can tell you this, the wisest decision you will ever make is that decision to put your faith and trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago. He died in your place that you could have eternal life. He paid the price. He, he paid for your sins, something you could never do. And he offers the gift of eternal life. All you need to do is make the choice to accept it. To not make that choice is to make a choice to reject it. What have you done with the greatest in the greatest decision that you could ever make? If you have not yet made that decision today, I really encourage you, I urge you to understand the importance of it. What will you do with Jesus? If you're a follower of Christ, on those many decisions and that we're continually making, are we going to serve Him? Are we going to be obedient to Him? Um, God gives us the ability to make choices. He allows us to do that. Make choices that are pleasing to God by taking the time to determine from the principles of the Word of God what it is that God would have you to do. And you will never regret those decisions. But there's always decisions that you and I make and we look back uh, because many times those decisions were not made with the really referring to the things of God and the Word of God. And we look back and we have regrets for many of those decisions. But if you're making decisions based upon what God has revealed to us, following the principles of the Word of God, you'll never be sorry for those. You'll never, uh, you'll never regret them. And the consequences of those decisions will never come back to haunt you. There'll be good consequences. I pray that this would be what will guide our lives uh, today, making wise decisions based on the principles of God's Word. We're so glad that you've been with us today. We do, uh, we do of course, invite you back next Sunday. We have a Bible study uh, here at First Baptist on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We encourage you to tune in to that as well. Um, at 7 o'clock, and um, you can find it on Facebook, or if you'd like to go to our church website, there's a link for that as well. The website is at berlinfbc.com. So I encourage you to uh, be part of that, and then we'll see you next Sunday. Have a blessed week. Enjoy discerning the perfect will of God as we follow the principles from the Word of God. Thank you for being with us today.